G'day. Welcome to Emergency Medicine Topics in One Coffee. I'm Alan Giles, an emergency physician, and today we're going to look at submassive and massive pulmonary embolism. Let's use a real case as a starter. Here is a 75-year-old man who presents to ED with sudden onset of shortness of breath and lightheadedness. He's previously well with controlled hypertension and borderline diabetes. His only medications are perindopril and low-dose aspirin. He lives with his wife at home, is retired, and has recently taken up Spanish guitar. In ED, he looks unwell with a heart rate of 110 per minute and a blood pressure of 100 systolic. He's afebrile and has a clear chest. On room air, his oxygen saturations are 88%, which go up to 92% on 6 litres per minute via a Hudson mask. As seen here, his chest x-ray is clear. This is his ECG. You can see it shows sinus tachycardia, right bundle branch block, and if you look closely, an S1, Q3, T3. Unsurprisingly, a pulmonary embolism was suspected, and it was confirmed on a CTPA, which is seen here. So we have a number of therapeutic options, don't we? Heparin alone, IV thrombolytics, which may be full dose or half dose, uh, catheter-directed lysis, even surgical embolectomy. Now, if he had been in cardiac arrest, the decision would be pretty simple. Thrombolysis systemically. Give it as a bolus. You don't have much to lose, and it just might work. However, let's assist with this difficult decision by getting a bit more information. A bedside echo was performed and shows the effect of right heart strain. Now, this is not the echo, but it was very similar with a dilated right ventricle, which is best seen on the apical four chamber view. And on the parasternal short axis view, the elevated right heart pressure is causing what's called a D-shaped left ventricle, as we can see here. And probably not surprisingly, his bedside troponin test is mildly elevated. If you use the JAF et al. 2011 definition, his pulmonary embolus is submassive, not massive. Massive being sustained hypotension less than 90 millimeters of mercury for more than 50 minutes, and persistent profound bradycardia or pulselessness. So he's certainly not that. But he does fit into submassive. That is, he's got right ventricular dysfunction or myocardial necrosis, yep, with a blood pressure greater than 90 millimeters of mercury, along with ECG signs and echo signs of right heart strain. Yeah, so he fits into that. So what to do? Well, a reasonable principle would be that if the predicted mortality from the PE is greater than that from the lysis, then let's thrombolize. So is it? Well, the problem is the bleeding, as the 2014 PETHOS trial showed. In a thousand patients with submassive PEs, the mortality dropped a bit, but there was a significant amount of bleeding. In fact, 2% risk of intracerebral hemorrhage in those greater than 75 years of age, and 6% of patients bled enough to require a blood transfusion. There are, of course, other reasons to try thrombolysis. Essentially, to decrease later pulmonary hypertension, have better exercise tolerance, and decrease right heart failure. So, if we are understandably worried about the bleeding, but want the benefits, why not half the TPA dose and see what happens? And that's exactly what the Moppet trial did in 2013. They gave enoxaparin and half-dose TPA versus enoxaparin alone. Well, those people who had renal failure got heparin instead of enoxaparin. So 16% in the thrombolysis group got pulmonary hypertension compared to 57% in the control group. Mortality was 1.6% in the thrombolysis group versus 5% in the control group, but it wasn't statistically significant. And interestingly, there was no major bleeding in either group. Now that sounds good. There were, of course, a few weaknesses to the study, like the definition of submassive was a bit soft, it wasn't a blinded study, and it was a single center. Okay, let's stop chatting about trials and get back to the patient. After much discussion, it was decided to throw the dice and he was given full dose thrombolysis. This is the patient briefly discussing what occurred. When I realised I had the condition, I uh, went to the general practitioner and was feeling absolutely dreadful. And then I got carted into the hospital and they gave me oxygen, which relieved things a bit. And then they gave me heparin, I think. And then uh, I was 
and with the mask and then later on they made the decision to give me that drug busting um, drug and absolutely magic I mean an hour after I'd had it I was you know I felt like I could get up off the bed and walk around the hospital it was really a magic bullet and I was so pleased that the decision was made in that direction from then I just improved and I had warfarin and so on and, and, and I'm back to normal so well a confession the patient is in fact my father and I advised on that decision. It was a few years ago now, and on reflection, if it happened today, I would probably give half-dose thrombolysis. What else should we mention before pulling up stumps? Catheter-directed therapy can be a good option in massive pulmonary emboli, if you have the option in your hospital. And if you have a slick, coordinated system with a 24-hour page and a dedicated team, like the one in New York Presbyterian Hospital, you might use their algorithm, which is like this. But for the rest of us mere mortals, remember, get all your information together, the patient's risks, ECG, echo, troponin, consult, then consider using half-dose thrombolysis in that submassive pulmonary emboli group. Well, that'll just about do for submassive and massive pulmonary emboli in one coffee. I'll see you all next time. Cheers.